today I'm speaking to Arul, the deputy chairperson of the Party of Socialist Malaysia, PSM. Um, welcome, Arul. Now, Malaysia has had its second um, appointed government, appointed by the king, in a second appointed government in a row. Uh, and uh, is this a, some sort of crisis for uh, parliamentary democracy in, in Malaysia? Yeah, it's... You know, it's whether it's a parliamentary crisis or a political crisis, you know, because uh, what has happened is since the last election, the government has not got a clear majority. So the majority, there's a lot of people calling for this anti-hoping law because the government is not stable. MPs can jump, you know, uh, from one party to another to destabilize the government. So I think uh, this, the, the latest... Um, crisis happened when AMNO has his own internal crisis and AMNO being the party longest in power, they were able to uh, create a crisis and then withdrew the support from the government they were in, you know, and, and, um, and I think, so this has made and, and truly true that the last two governments have not been appointed by the people, there's no elections, and there is no uh, any call for referendum, and a lot of a lot of first thing, a lot of young people uh, also feel the same way that this is elite politics, because MPs decide, they go in their you know their Porsche cars to the king's king, and then the king decides, you know, uh, he looks at SD, and the king has become uh, very powerful. Um, uh, and 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 his power has been actually basically enhanced because now he he basically selects who's the who is the uh, before this he basically endorses what the election results are but now today he has become he decides you know he looks at the statutory declaration and in a certain hand he has got a lot of public support to it because public feel that. These politicians are hopeless. The king is uh, doing the, the, the great job of, of getting to stabilize the thing. So yes, so we are we have been um, there's been change of government and this new government uh, is also with the government with 114 MPs, just uh, three shots, you know, three three MPs above. No, so you just need another three MPs to jump and it will become destabilized again. That is how. Uh, vulnerable this, this current government is. Now, the parliament is set to resume uh, sometime this month. And uh, so when you would assume that when the parliament resumed, um, the government's, the new government's majority can be tested in a vote of uh, no confidence or something. That's the usual thing in parliamentary democracies. But I understand that there may not, this may not actually take place. Is that right? Yeah, actually, Parliament is supposed to sit today. Yesterday, you know, it's supposed to start, but it has been postponed, you know, postponed to next week, postponed by a week. So a lot of people are wondering why, you know, because uh, it, there was a big struggle to get this Parliament session going. You know, a lot of people wanted to bring, make the Parliament dates earlier. And then finally, it was delayed because and then during the delay, see the, the previous prime minister, when he was clinching to power, the last thing he said was, I will go to parliament and seek a word of uh, confidence. You know, that was his promise to the king, but, but it collapsed, his government collapsed. And then when there was a joint meeting with the king, with all the uh, parties, political parties, there was a statement made by the king where it was stated clearly that whoever is appointed the prime minister will test his confidence in parliament. But now suddenly, the, the attorney general uh, says, you don't need to do that. You know, he says, you just don't need to go do it because if you do it, you're going against the king's wishes because the king was already appointed. If you're going to go back to parliament and ask for a word of confidence, you are undermining the king, you know? And, and, and the, the worst thing in Malaysian politics is the king, sorry, the attorney general and the speaker are brothers, blood brothers, 
Okay. So, and the and there's a worry now that they don't want to seek a word of confidence in parliament. So now the for, for people like us, we were pushing for a word of confidence because at least, you know, then the you can at least see which MPs voted where. Because all this while, this statutory declaration has been something done in secrecy. Uh, the king writes to them, they write back, they send something in letter, you know, but it's not seen in the open. So it's very important for this word of confidence, even though the opposition has said that they will not disrupt uh, the current government, you know, they will not put them, they, they will give them the support, something like that. In that sense, so that seems now to be a real fear <laughs> Why, why the ruling party uh, is afraid to call a word of confidence? So now the question arises: whether they actually do they have a do they have a simple majority? So I think that is the that is the news which is playing in the country in the last uh, forty eight hours. Yeah. Now, uh, before the king made his latest appointment um, uh, of of the new government. Or, or at least uh, the prime minister, um, did, did, um, there was probably a lot of people worrying that there was going to be some sort of uh, comeback of the old forces in AMNO um, in, in, in a bigger way in this government. But you have stated that actually the new cabinet that has been appointed is really not that much different, not that much different from the previous cabinet. So is there any element of AMNO comeback in this latest change of government? Um, actually, a lot of people don't call it a change of government. They just call it a cabinet reshuffle because uh, almost 90% of the cabinet members are retained. You know, and uh, almost all the same political parties are the same government, you know. And most of the cabinet members' position are intact. And the cabinet is as big as before, you know, as bulky as before. The only thing has changed is the prime minister has been changed. And AMNO leader has been, has been put in place. And the AMNO leader, you see, just uh, before uh, this happened, within AMNO, we could see that the Registrar of Societies, the ROS, was, was making um, a number of statements. No? They, were, they did not recognize the, the AMLO election and few things. You know? So everyone knew that the next thing, if they do not, AMLO might be dissolved you know, through administratively. You know, they might say AMLO didn't follow. And, you know, so that was in place. Suddenly, when they came to power, when, when Ismail Sabri from AMNO, the Registrar of Society withdrew whatever earlier issues they had with AMNO. So perhaps what, 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 what would, would have most likely happened is AMNO has finally come to an uh, agreement that you know there was a tussle between AMNO because who should be the who, who to put, put as the prime minister candidate, and they have resolved that crisis. And, and because of that, it has become a new, the new prime minister is from AMNO, but AMNO itself is not as stable because, you know, in those days, AMNO will hold the position of the, the ruling, the AMNO will hold the position of the home minister, which is very critical. Now the home minister is in the hands of Bersatu, the Mugidin's party. Finance minister is with AMLO still, you know. So, um, so they have made some compromises. And very recently, two days ago, they appointed Muhyiddin Yassin as the COVID, as a special committee. They made COVID as the head of the special committee. So it seems now that there has been a role, a deal has been made, you know, to, okay, uh, you become, you, you take over, but you don't destabilize the government. Now, previously, there was some talk of a, a sort of national unity government. That is a government that somehow uh, brought in uh, the major opposition parties, 
um, like PKR, DAP, et cetera, into some sort of uh, uh, new um, unity government. Was that ever a prospect? Was there, were there negotiations taking place? And, and, and what were those opposition parties prepared to do uh, in terms of uh, you know, considering participation in such a government? See, uh, first thing is um, the election option is something not on the table because uh, of the situation of the pandemic. The COVID is so bad that the riot would not agree for an uh, election to be held. In the absence of an election, the call for a unity government has suddenly become a popular call, not only among the opposition, even among the civil society, like groups like uh, Berse is calling for a unity government. Uh, people like Chinwad, you know, uh, is calling for unity government, and PSM, and also has taken a similar position that you should have to to create a, a stable. There should be a unity unity government, and and you know you should have good people put into and try to stabilize the country until the election, but fix a date for an election, you know, something like that. So in the, in in that sense. And Mahadi also called for a unity government. But at that point of time, the opposition didn't agree for that. You know, when Muhyiddin was uh, at the, at the a week before he resigned, actually, he finally sort of uh, gave an olive leaf to the opposition where he said, uh, I will change the system. I'll get you into the, I'll make the, select committee stronger, I will make the prime ministers, their opposition leader, a full minister position and all that. He tried something, you know, which many said to be a unity government. He, he put out a few things like anti-hopping law, uh, a law for some very good reforms, you know, uh, limit the term of the prime minister and all that. So in that sense, but then the opposition didn't agree to that. They want him to resign first. So there was a, some split within the opposition on this question. Uh, Mahade, uh, Pajuang, and all that. Mahade's party wanted the unity government. Of course, perhaps, uh, but but people from here, uh, Anwar, Lim, uh, Lim Goaling, Mat Sabu, the Pakatan Harapan coalition, which is the main opposition coalition, felt that you know maybe they could just take over power, you know, from we did, you know, you don't have to worry. So they didn't support for the unity government. So, and then you both parties went and finally a new government was uh, formed. And initially we thought that he would, uh, he mentioned things like he'll bring in the opposition into the play. A lot of people thought the cabinet will be unity government. Then there was an announcement there won't be a unity government, but we'll form a COVID uh, special task force where we'll invite the opposition. So now it doesn't look like a unity government. It looks like the same recycled uh, previous government, you know, and uh, they're going to put some people, and this is also what the king was asking. He called all the parties. King wanted a unity government. So there is a, some kind of uh, agreement not to, not to create any problems until the next election. So when uh, when the parliament actually resumes, do you think there's going to be um, a, a, a test through a no confidence motion of uh, whether or not this government still has the numbers? Or do you think uh, that is not going to happen? I think, I think uh, ultimately, uh, I think this one week uh, postponement is for them to make sure they have that simple majority and then they will go for a word of confidence because if not, it will look ridiculous. It will really look as if that they don't have the support, you see. So I think they needed this one week. Of course, everybody all the time, huh, the COVID has been very helpful for, the, <laughs> for them to be clinching. So every time they'll use one excuse that COVID situation is bad, you know. Uh, the, the last parliament session, the five-day session was even brought short because they said some people were infected by COVID and they postponed it. So Now, now yeah. this, this whole uh, system of uh, lots and lots of um, politicians jumping from one party to another, hopping, 
Um, isn't it uh, implicitly corrupt? You know, do people, these politicians, they're obviously offered something to jump, uh, to hop. Uh, so are we seeing uh, kind of, um, you know, if, if you like a deepening of corruption after all, I mean, the, the previous momentum was, uh, you know, to, to, to condemn corruption and the, the former Najib, Prime Minister Najib now is facing trial and everything else, you know, is the mood shifting? Is there, is there now more acceptance that politics can go back to the old dirty ways of uh, wheeling and dealing behind the people's back? Yeah, the dealing behind the people's back has been the norm, you know, it has been something along in, in the... In. For example, uh, GLCs, uh, all GLCs position, government link companies, directorships, everything has been given to politicians who don't qualify, you know, even though there's been a lot of call not to allow politicians to sit in GLCs, but even, even then, uh, there was during Pakatan Harapan, they, they could have got rid of it, they didn't, because they still wanted to have the GLCs there. But what was worse now is, it's given to really Every Tom, Dick, and Harry who's there, they just, that is one thing. Secondly, they've used the anti-corruption to actually go for politicians. And then you can see, it can be seen systematically, you know, like what, what happened to like uh, Xavier from, from Pakatan Harapan. Suddenly he, you know, there was an investigation going on him on anti-corruption, a few things. And then suddenly he announces that, He's, he's leaving Pakatan Harapan and then corruption, everything stops, the investigation stops. So it's clear they're using uh, soft and hard approaches. You know, they're taking cases against uh, those. So they're using the same uh, old tactics and very corrupt. Uh, you know, here they, they're using this new term called durian, you know. Uh, durian is falling, you see. And, and to say that, you know, the, you, if you vote for me, uh, you have a durian. So... So it is the same, same old uh, politics, same old, uh, and, and, and it has not improved a bit. Now, with the, with the pandemic weighing down the lives of most people, they struggle just to, to get through it. Um, uh, the politics of protest has so, sort of shifted to uh, mainly to some actions led by uh, youth, around the Lawan protests. Um, and they have been uh, facing a, a bit of repression, I understand. Has there been a, a return to a more repressive approach by the police and by the state? So the, the Kita Lawan is a group of uh, young people quite, quite fed up with uh, politics, elite politics, but they face a different, uh, very uh, pandemic scenario of course, there's a lot of question whether you should go for a protest during a pandemic. You know, that is another debate at the side. But in spite of them, they did one uh, protest end of July, which actually uh, more than a thousand people attended, which was one of the most, was one of the big, well, with the pandemic, it was quite a huge uh, rally. And a lot of youth were involved. And the state was initially quite uh, accommodative. They did not go, you know, but as, as the time went, they became more repressive. Um, they went, first time, you know, they go in, used to, they used to call people in for questioning, but this time they went even to their houses to check whether they live in, in those houses, which is something which was not done before. They've also charged some of them, which they've not done before. Before this, they might just call them for questioning and release them. So repression has sort of increased. Uh, and, and there has been uh, more sterner warnings given to this, uh, those who are attending the rallies. So, and, and, and I think, yeah. So there is now a mood that people are getting frustrated and they are definitely worried that this rally might get bigger. So, and, and the last rally, they, they just, uh, just a minute, they, they had one, uh, they took even a court order to stop the rally. Now, does this reflect some sort of um, um, broader sympathy for this, this youth protest? Yes, there is a worry that the, this, this rallies will grow bigger. 
that grew uh, huge. And of course, and, and also just there was uh, one, the minister, the DG of health said that the Kita Lawan, the rally, did not create any cluster, you know. So that was a boost for the Kita rally, Kita Lawan people, because it shows, because the early argument was the rally is going to create a COVID cluster, shouldn't go, you know. So when, when, when the DG came out with a statement that when there was a question asked, that was there anybody from Kita Lawan, you know, and he says there was none, no, no reported cases. It boosted the Kita Lawan, uh, this one, uh, call for the rally. They did get a lot of public uh, sympathy though. August 31 was the 64th anniversary of Malaysia's independence from British rule. Um, if you reflect back in that broader period, uh, do you feel that uh, politics in Malaysia has uh, managed to free itself from the, I guess, the, the bequeath politics of divide and rule uh, between the major racial groups? Has there been any um, uh, move forward to break from, from, from that uh, all racialization of politics? In everybody's mind, uh, COVID is at the center point. You know, COVID pandemic, the death rate is very high in Malaysia. It's one of the highest in the world currently. You know, it's about uh, almost 300 people dying a day, you know, and, and it's very serious. And, and so a lot of people are actually very preoccupied with these thoughts, you know, to actually even think about racial politics. <laughs> but, but the issue is, the, the current government has reinforced, you know, that when AMNO, one of the conditions AMNO gave was no DAP into the new government. No? So it's trying to reinforce the view that DAP is a Chinese uh, based party or a non, non, non Malay based party. They should not have any role in the government. So they kept reinforcing that when they wanted to form the takeover power. So in, in that sense, racial politics is, is very much uh, right there. We just heard uh, yesterday that they are going to make some amendments to the Sharia law where they are going to have new laws to curb uh, non malays from a non, non-Islamic relig religion from, you know, they're going to have more restrictions. So I think this are put there to create further uh, diversion, you know, from, from the real day-to-day -day economic crisis, issues of housing, healthcare, and all that, you know, to, because this is something which is proven. But I think more, and in, in, in a certain way, the pandemic unites the people on the ground. A lot of uh, like help aid is, is, goes across the board. People from different uh, racial and religious groups come together to, to, you know, help each other. So there are opportunities created by COVID on grassroots solidarity, but the elite is still using racial politics as ever to still be in power.